All right, well, let's jump in. So I think if you're new, we're going through growing up. You don't have to read it, but you would be enriched if you did. And we're going two chapters at a time. So tonight we'll cover chapter three and four. Next week we'll cover chapter five and six. And uh, last week, just to review the high, high points of what we talked about, um, was mostly the, the need for disciple making in the local church. And we looked at a couple key passages, of course, the Great Commission, which we want to just never tire of talking about and pushing as what the church needs to be about. And that is making disciples everywhere we go and baptizing and then teaching everything that Jesus taught. It's, it's the fundamental calling of the local church and it's the fundamental calling of every Christian. It's not just for missionaries. It's not just for Africa. It's for Abilene as well. So that main verb, make disciples who make disciples. And again, that's one of Southside's core values. And we want to constantly be growing in that. And then 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the idea of passing on. So even tonight as we're learning, in any sermon, anytime you're engaging God's word, not only for your own benefit, but thinking, how can I pass it on to others? Who will then pass it on to others? Who will then pass it on to others? It's the Lord's plan for growing the church and preserving the gospel. And then with, with multiplication in mind as well. So the idea is with your discipleship group, however many end up, that them going and doing the same doing the same, doing the same, and seeing just how much potential there is when we do that. And we'll hit a little bit tonight, but he also talked about not only is this for, you know, helping others grow, but it's one of the main ways we grow. And we'll, we'll read Ephesians 4 here in a moment, where he talked about the pathway to Christian maturity is through ministry. So uh, before we jump into chapter 3, the stat that I see again and again and again and again from different people too. Lots of people have done these studies and I'm typically pretty skeptical of studies, but when you have, you have multiple places doing multiple studies and coming at the same number regularly, I tend to give them a little bit of credibility. Uh, one of those not topic tonight, one of those is giving again and again and again, you see that uh, even Bible believing Christians give somewhere between 2.5 and 2.8% of their income. You see that again and again from different perspectives, which uh, lends me to think there's something to it. Uh, the other one, though, is this idea of kids who are raised in the church and then fall away at some point, usually pretty quickly in college. And the numbers range is from 60 to 80. And I think uh, I, there was a pretty recent one by Lifeway. And of course, Lifeway is a credible organization and theirs was around 70. Uh, so we've got to ask what's going on there. And I think one, there's lots of things I think we could say, but one of the things that, that I think we've got to think about is this lack of discipleship. And we as Southern Baptists in particular are really good at evangelism and missions. That's been our thing. It's really why the convention was started way back when. But one of our weaknesses is we put a lot of effort into winning souls. That's a, that's a strength. But one of the weaknesses is not nearly enough effort in keeping them and making disciples. And so we put so much effort and stock into just getting that decision, just get them to pray a prayer and then act like that's all that needs to be done by the church. Well, biblically, that's just the beginning. That's a great thing that we want to celebrate, but that is not the finish line. That's the starting line. And then we've got a lot of work to do to make disciples who make disciples. So, you know, we love to see, see those decisions, but you know what I celebrate even more is seeing people finish well. Not only start well, but finish well. And discipleship is one of the main ways we get there. So let's, if you've got the book, let's jump into chapter three uh, and go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn over to Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter 4, and let's read verses 7 to 16. Ephesians 4, 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, and he quotes a psalm, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? 
He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now that's a little bit wordy, but the basic point he's making is Jesus is the victor who now gives gifts. He's the victorious one, verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, same word as pastors, and teachers. So we just summarized that he gave church leaders. Here's the reason in verse 12. To equip the saints. And remember in the New Testament, every believer is a saint. We've all been set apart. To equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So again just to summarize that there's a lot there but Jesus is the victor who gives gifts to his church. And the, the purpose of those gifts is to equip the church, equip the saints to do the work of ministry so that, and he had all this kind of lofty language, but basically he says that we would reach maturity, to reach the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, to become fully like Jesus, to grow in our knowledge of him. Let's summarize that and just say Christian maturity. So Christ gives gifts to his church in church leaders equips so that they would equip everybody so that everybody would do their part to bring us to maturity. And then he tells us a little bit about how that's done in verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And this is just a beautiful, beautiful passage. It starts with Christ, and then there's church leaders, but the church leaders are not the end goal. They're just a means to an end, which is equipping the church to do the work. So notice how he starts there in verse 7. He starts with the, with the every, every member. Verse 7, grace was given to each one of us. Every believer has been given grace. Then he talks about Jesus. Then he talks about church leaders. And then he goes back to every member. And then he closes it again, verse um, 16, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, a lot of churches are not as healthy as they could be because they don't have this every member aspect. They just kind of have your, you know, your professional Christians who do all the work. And the believers then just come, they just come and sit and attend and and never do anything. We've got this kind of clergy lady distinction that we've inherited really from the Catholic church. That's just unbiblical. Churches are healthy when we have each part doing their work. And what is the fundamental work? Helping others grow in Christ, helping others mature. That's the whole point of D groups. So that's, that's where we're at. Let me stop there. Any questions on Ephesians four, this vision before we, we jump into chapter three. All right, so chapter three is really helpful, practical. It's just called, it's the D group, a blueprint. So it gets pretty practical on what we're talking about here. And if you've got your book, look on page 34. Third paragraph in, he says this, the driving purpose of this book is to help you become a disciple who makes disciples. In my experience, both in my personal spiritual growth and in my ministry, the D group is the most effective vehicle for getting you to this destination. I am convinced that those who are serious about discipleship will be a part of a D group and that churches that are serious about making disciples will both provide and promote D groups in the assembly. And then he goes on to explain why he thinks that. And again, we've got various outlets of ministry that are all important at Southside. We've got, of course, our corporate gathering, uh, and we've got home groups, and we've got Bible classes, and we've got gathering, we've got men's breakfasts. Those are all great things, but the, the depth, true spiritual growth, multiplication, I think, and Robbie Gallaty thinks are going to happen at the D group level. And in these pages on 36 and 37, he talks about why, why they're different. 
why a D group is, is going to be more effective than other types of groups. And number one, he says, first, the D group is a closed group. So it's not one where you're going to be adding people. It's you set it from the beginning and you're going to go deep with these particular people over a period of time. Unlike a home group or unlike a Bible study class, they can be fluid sometimes. Some of our home groups are closed uh, for this reason. Number two, he says, the purpose is different. And so home group, a lot of it is community and fellowship. Uh, Bible study classes, a lot of his learning, you know, we're in rows mostly in our classes. But a D group, the purpose is to develop a deeper walk individually. Uh, and then thirdly, lastly, uh, he talks about it being a, a more intimate, accountable relationship. Again, by nature of two things, really. Number one, the size, because if it's smaller, you're going to gain trust and feel, feel better about sharing struggles. And then uh, number two, the same gender thing. Because we'll talk about confession of sin in a little bit and how that plays out. And in the D group, he talks about three dynamics that you're going to find. You're going to find, number one, unity as you grow together. And then number two, you're going to find accountability and then multiplication in a unique way in a D group. So unity in community. Flip over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Beautiful picture of the life of the early church. Let's, let's just read uh, 42 to 44. And remember, just, just a little bit of context. Obviously, the church really has just started. This is right after Pentecost. The Spirit's been given. Verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. So you, the Spirit then creates unity in community. And that's where a D group can go really deep. And again, when our goal is multiplication, not only emphasizing reaching other believers, but even unbelievers, that's, I think, when, when real depth of community begins, when you're on mission together, whether the mission is growing in Christ-likeness or reaching unbelievers. That's why I would often say, and I don't think it's original to me, but this Acts 2 community does not come without Acts 1 mission. Acts 1-8, Jesus says, go and be my witnesses. You'll receive power and you'll be witnesses. So the reason they were able to grow deep is because they were on mission together. And probably all of you experienced that. You know, when you go out and you do work together for the Lord, you're just knit, right? How many of you have been on, like, even if it's just a week-long mission trip? Like, maybe it was, maybe you went to college and it was a college mission trip, right? You didn't know those people, probably most of them before you went. And you went together on mission for one week and they're still friends. And you can pick back up. There's just something that the Spirit does to bond us together when we're on mission together. So unity and community, you go deep, you get to know one another really well. You have true biblical fellowship. And in the book, he, he says fellowship is like uh, two fellows in the same ship. The idea, again, together, on mission, going somewhere. So a D group uniquely provides community, depth of relationship. And again, we're just talking about Christian friendship here. And then number two, uh, a D group uniquely brings accountability. Because again, you're able to get to know one another, you're able to gain trust, and you're able to ask hard questions. And he helpfully lays out some things about accountability in here. He says that accountability requires confidentiality. It requires confrontation. It requires confession. And it requires uh, compassion. So confrontation. Uh, and again, we all need this. We all need loving exhortation from one another. And so he uses Matthew 18. He mentions Galatians 6, 1. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who have the spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, bearing one another's burdens. So we need that. We need people as we begin to stray to be restored 
when we get caught in transgression, a brother or sister that can restore us. So confrontation, we, we, we just got to get used to it and we've got to even value it. Then confession. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to one another. You don't have to answer anything, but let me just, let me just ask, is there anyone in your life that you conf- you're able to confess your sins to? The Bible says we ought to confess them to one another. So there's an assumption there that we have that, that outlet. 1 John 1, 9 and 10. Many of you know this one. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So confession is absolutely vital. Then John goes on to say, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So to say, you know what, I don't, I don't need confession. You're, you're calling God a liar and the word's not in you because we're all sinners and we will continue to fight sin. That's another way to describe this is we are fighting sin together. In fact, um, this book's new to me, but a book that I've really been influenced by with D groups is a book called uh, Gospel Centered Discipleship. And they don't call them D groups in that book. He calls them fight clubs. Now, I don't, I don't like that terminology, but the idea is fighting sin together. I do like that idea. So we need to be, D groups provide an opportunity for confrontation, someone that can ask us the hard questions, confession, so we can confess our sins to one another. And then the third one is uh, compassion. Compassion. Oh, sorry, I, I missed confidentiality. I, I missed that. He starts out there, obviously, in a D group. When you're sharing sin, there just has to be right up front, what is confessed in this group stays in this group. And this is where it's just from the get-go. And there's, there's a covenant in the appendix, we'll get there later, that, that I recommend using with this opposite groups where you sign off. Uh, a, that you're committed to seeing this thing through, but part of it is that you're going to be confidential. And so it's a group that can, uh, that can be, you can trust. So that's, that needs to be an assumption uh, going into it. So confidentiality, confrontation, confession, and then compassion as sin is confessed. First Corinthians 10, 12, let anyone who thinks that he stands, take heed lest he fall. In Galatians 6, that passage uh, says something really similar. Let me read it all. The idea is that none of us are very far. We're, we're all in this together. We're all weak. We share that. And so when there's confession of sin, there is no judgment, right? There's compassion. So Galatians 6, let me read the full context. Brothers, if anyone's caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's brothers' burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Because as people confess or as we confront, the tendency is for us to think we're better. And so Paul says in Corinth and Galatia, hey, take heed lest you fall. Watch yourself. And then the last piece is multiplication that, that makes a D group unique. So you're meeting with three or four people with the goal that those three or four people will go meet with three or four people and on and on and on. So those are some ways that, uh, that make a D group the secret sauce of discipleship because of its size and gender exclusion and, and purposes. And then again, he hits it again, just with Jesus's model. You know, if he's our Lord, we ought to follow what he does. And he had, up, he had the large group, he had the small group of 12, and then he had his three, right? And he was Jesus. He was the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He could have done whatever he wanted. He stayed small because he invested his life into these, uh, these three men in particular. Galilee says that four is a really good number, really good ideal number. And of course, gender exclusive, men with men, women with women. Uh, he has a little section in here, if you're reading it, if you're interested on why he doesn't think one-on-one is actually the best route. Uh, I, for me, I'm not going to discourage one-on-one. I'm not going to discourage any type of disciple making that's happening, but I tend to agree that you can be more effective with two, three, four, five, and he's got a few pages on why he thinks so. That's on page 47 and following if, you, if you've got the book. He has an appendix in here on some examples, and he's, he's stealing these, using these from John Wesley. John Wesley and George Whitfield and Charles Wesley had, had a group like this. I think they called it the Holy Club. 
maybe the Holiness Club, and uh, they would have these kinds of questions they would ask every time. So I'm going to read these he has from Appendix 7. And these are questions that can just be the norm. You can, you know, you can use a few of them, use all of them, change them. But the idea is you're getting together and you're going to be serious about following the Lord. Number one, have you spent time in the Word and in prayer this week? And if you're in a D group and you know you're going to be asked that next Tuesday, you're probably going to make a little bit of extra effort to be in the Word and prayer. Number two, have you shared the gospel or your testimony with an unbeliever this week? And what's so exciting to me about this type of question is also in your prayer time as you pray for specific people. You know, you get two, three, four people together and you're praying for your neighbor, John, and looking for opportunities. That's just exciting to see. It's just going to build in intentionality or accountability. That's number two. Number three, have you spent quality time with your family this week? Number four, have you viewed anything immoral this week? Number five, have you had any lustful thoughts or tempting attitudes this week? Number six, have you told any lies or half-truths to put yourself in a positive light before others? Number seven, have you participated in anything unethical this week? And number eight, have you lied about any of your answers today? <laughs> And so again, you can use those, you can modify those, but the idea is you're fighting sin together, you're intentionally walking with Christ together. That's the D group blueprint in a nutshell. Let me stop there. Did y'all have any insights from chapter three or any questions, comments about what we covered in chapter three? Let me shy. Hey, Blake, can you speak a little bit into why you think uh, signing a covenant beforehand can be helpful in this context? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me open up his real quick. I think he'll actually speak to that, too, later. Um, the short answer, I think, is just accountability. Yeah, so let me just read his disciple-making covenant. It's Appendix 1, if you have the book. I will commit to the following expectations. Number one, I pledge myself fully to the Lord with the anticipation that I'm entering a time of accelerated spiritual transformation. Number two, I'll meet with my D group for approximately one and one and a half hours every week, unless providentially hindered. There we go. Can you hear me? Okay, um, number three, I will complete all assignments on a weekly basis before my D group meeting in order to contribute to the discussion. Number four, I will contribute to an atmosphere of confidentiality, honesty, and transparency for the edification of others in the group, as well as my own spiritual growth. Number five, I will pray every week for the other men or women who are on the discipleship journey with me. And number six, I will begin praying about replicating the discipleship process upon completion of this group. So basically just for accountability and increased seriousness. And, and in these groups, one of the, what we got to be careful about is just a gospel centered culture. You know, even as we ask accountability questions, getting the gospel. So this doesn't become some legalistic check mark duty bound thing. Uh, Cause that can happen. And in my experience, I think it's good for us to have realistic expectations. Uh, let's say you do four, you know, say you start with four uh, inevitably there will be discouragements. You know, I mentioned last week, even Jesus had a Judas. And so a covenant can help, I think, just make it more serious. Uh, one pastor friend who does this will actually call the spouse. Uh, his is a little, it's a little different structure. In, in our setting, I think you can do the D group and not actually lose, really lose about an hour a week. You can get up early, you can do it later. In his context, he would have like a, an evening. So basically he lost an evening. The, the the person in the class would lose an evening. So he would call the spouse and just get the, he might even have them sign a covenant, but basically, Hey, I need you in this. I need you to, to help your spouse make it to this. And trust me in 10, 12 weeks, whatever it is, you'll thank me because he'll be, he'll be a better man because of this, but I need you to help enable him to, to make it kind of thing. 
But if you're uncomfortable with it, I'm, I wouldn't require such a thing. I don't know that I, the last couple that I've done, I don't think I did a covenant. Good question, though. Any other thoughts? Chapter three. Yeah, I had a question. Um, I don't know what on page fifty? There's that um, highlight the benefits of, of a group of three to five. What are some potential challenges of a group of this size? My experience has been basically one on one, maybe maybe three total people. You know, uh, when I was discipled and and the groups that I've been in. So, uh, anybody want to speak to challenges when you have a group of three to five? I would say just the logistics of meeting together, getting schedules to align. I mean, that's kind of surface level, but I mean, like Blake was saying, like committing to it and having a time. I think another one can just be, sometimes there's a dominator of conversation and a not dominator of conversation. So somebody that just like slides in and then somebody that takes all of the, whoever's leading it, their time where they have bigger quote unquote problems. And so you spend, seems like every week talking about the same person's life a lot or something. So potentially something to be managed. Yeah, one hard part if you have three or four is if someone doesn't make it a week, it changes the dynamic quite a bit. But again, I think I think there's flexibility. I, I I tend to agree that that Galatees are right about the most effectiveness. But maybe you're like, you know what, I'm I'm just not comfortable with that. I'm gonna do one. Or maybe you're like, you know what, I'm gonna do eight. Again, there's the beauty of this is there's just no wrong answer. If we're if we're seeking to grow in the Lord and help others grow in the Lord, do what works. <laughs> And Lord willing, we've all got lots of years ahead of us. We can try it all. All right, let's move on to chapter four then. Chapter four was on godliness. I'm curious, I'd like to hear from you all. What, what's a good definition? Maybe, maybe you read, you've got the cheater answer, but what, what does it mean to be godly? Or let me ask it this way, maybe. What do you think of when you hear that person is godly? I think um, that there's evidence that they have a solid relationship with the Lord. There's evidence in their life that they're the real deal in, in seeking the Lord with every aspect of their life. I think the word surrender comes to mind, like they're surrendered to God. Um, not a slave or not, um, not to do this or, you know, but surrendered and having a personal relationship with God. I think the marks of an elder or deacon that you see in uh, First Timothy or Titus you know, it's, those are something that we should all be striving for, um, even if we're not an elder or deacon, but those are marks of God godliness, I believe. I think it's probably someone that you automatically think of that you can trust and uh, he stresses confidentiality in all of his lessons. Can't hear me, can you? Yeah, yeah, I can now. Somebody you can trust. And confidentiality. Yeah. Yeah, those are good. 
all that and more. He defines godliness on page 54 using an early church uh, philosopher as the right attitude to God and to things divine, the attitude which does not eliminate God altogether and which does not de degenerate into futile superstition, the attitude which gives God the place he ought to occupy in life and in thought and in devotion. Now, that's pretty wordy, but I think, you know, you could summarize it and say someone who's centered on God and wants to honor God in all things. And how does that look? Well, everything y'all said, um, also man or a woman of, of the word, they love God's word. They know the word uh, of prayer. Uh, but sometimes I think we can think of godliness in kind of esoteric ways. And I think the best way to define godliness is actually Christ's likeness. To be godly is to be like Jesus. But let me read uh, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 one says, Therefore, be imitators of God. What does that mean, to imitate God? Well, he tells us, As beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So imitate God means to walk in love. And how do we know what that looks like? Well, Jesus, he loved us and he gave himself up for us. So the heart of being godly is being like Jesus. And the heart of being like Jesus in terms of our lifestyle is self-giving love, which we'll talk a lot about on Sunday, actually. So what does it mean to be godly? It means to be like Christ. What does it mean to be like Christ? Well, we can read the Gospels and see how he cared for the marginalized, how he was committed to prayer. He knew the word. He was gentle. He sought to help. He was a truth teller. He preached the Gospel. But then you move to the letters, and the main thing we see about Christ-likeness from the letters is love, being a person who loves because of the Gospel. So we want to grow in that. Godliness equals Christ likeness. Now, how do we how do we grow in godliness? Well, you you emulate people that you spend a lot of time with. You end up picking up their their mannerisms and their gestures. And so the only way that we can do that is to immerse ourselves in the word. Word, yep. In the book, uh, Gallaty mentions God has three primary, he calls them change agents. So means that God uses to change us, means that God has given us to grow in godliness. Number one is people and primarily the church. Uh, as we walk with one another. Again, that assumes we're actually having intentional Christian fellowship. We're talking about the word. We're praying together. We're calling each other out when we need to. It's not just like the church out there in some abstract category helps us grow in godliness, but intentional relationships helps us grow in godliness. Uh, and then he mentioned circumstances. Uh, and this was, this is straight out of Romans chapter 8, uh, 28, 29. God's working all things for our good, those who love him, those who are called. But then in 29, we should never quote Romans 8, 28 without 29. God works all things together for the good, and then he defines the good in 29, and that is that we would be conformed to Jesus. So God is using circumstances to conform us to Jesus. And this was in large part what the sermon was about on Sunday, especially in terms of relationships. And if you're spending more time together, well, God's going to use that to conform us to Jesus if we'll lean into it. And we have no control over that though, right? I mean, we have control how we respond, but whatever circumstances come our way, we can't invite necessarily. So there's a third one, and this is really, really our responsibility. How can we grow in godliness? This is where it's on us, and that is what, if, what he calls the spiritual disciplines. What uh, some have called the means of grace. I actually like that terminology because it's the means God has given us that he might give us grace. So the power is there. We've just, our part is to plug into it. Or the imagery that Robbie uses is a, is a cells. So we can't control the wind, 
but we can hoist ourselves so that when the wind blows, we're ready. And so this is our part, the spiritual disciplines, the means of grace. And this is always humbling to me because that means that we can be as godly as we want to be. He's given us the spirit. He's given us his word. And so if we are not growing in godliness, it's on us because he's given us what we need. We want to grow in patience and love and, and, uh, and meekness and gentleness and love. Well, God's given the word, he's given the spirit. And so we have some means of grace then to grow in that direction. Flip over to 1 Timothy 4. First Timothy 4, 7. Four, seven, and eight have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Really great verse. Um, the, the, the verb for train is gymnasio. You can hear our word in there, right? Gymnasium. So we train. It's an active tense. It's a command. We are to train. And uh, training is not easy, right? <laughs> I feel like for three years I've been trying to run a 5K, and inevitably at some point something gets hurt. <laughs> it's hard. It's painful. He mentions losing weight, right? There's no quick fixes to losing weight. Especially with the uh, quarantine, right? Y'all heard the, uh, you know, you got your freshman 15. You've heard of the quarantine 15. <laughs> I saw some, I saw a couple of memes going around. One was like a lady or a man wearing a mask in the house. I'm like, why are you wearing a mask in the house? And well, it's just to stop me from comfort eating every 10 minutes. <laughs> Or uh, one, I saw one picture on a fridge and it was, it was like preaching to herself. She's like, girl, you do not need this. You just ate 10 minutes ago. Girl, bye. <laughs> so there's no quick fixes to losing weight. There's no quick fixes to godliness. That's why when you see someone who's godly, you know, someone who's holy, it's not as if they're specially gifted or they have some shortcut or they were born with it. You're looking at a person that has worked year after year after year after year over time so to grow in godliness is really hard work you know we always like to say it's harder today i don't know if that's true but one thing that our generation does have that other generations did not have is the internet and social media and smartphones and so much of the spiritual disciplines have to do with with sustained attention whether it be reading the word or praying, or meditating on scripture, or memorizing scripture. That's all mind work. And the mind is a really important thing in scripture, right? Romans 12 is where we're at. Through the renewal of the mind, we're transformed. And so when our smartphones and social media and internet has trained our attention span to be like three seconds long now, we are in an uphill battle to grow in godliness. Since the means he's given us all have to do with how we focus our attention. So it takes discipline to prioritize these things. Uh, word and prayer, we'll get into this next week. Word and prayer is really what we'll talk about, but it takes discipline to make it a priority, to make the time for it, and then when you're in it, to be present. One of the things I'm excited about that uh, I haven't been doing that we'll talk about later in this book is really just pulling out one, you know, because you say you read, even if you're just doing F260 and doing one chapter, uh, like today, let's say that you read, if I were to put you on the spot and say, tell me about what you read. Probably you just have fogginess, fogginess. <laughs> but one of the things we'll talk about later in the Here Journal is pulling one thing out, whether that's one verse or a half of a verse that you can take with you through the day uh, to help us in that regard. Flip over to Colossians 3. Uh, Robbie Gallaty's a really, really buff dude. So he has a lot of... Uh, time at the gym and a lot of gym analogies. And he talks about at one point he was a bouncer and then a trainer after he got saved. And 
he would notice that those who would find successful at the gym were those who had a plan. And uh, we'll talk about it more, but you got to have a plan in order to successfully do the means of grace over the long haul. Let's read Colossians 3.8. As we talk about growing in godliness, pretty crucial passage. In fact, let's start at verse 5. In fact, let's start at verse 1. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there's not Greek and Jews circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another, in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. It's such a rich passage on everything we've talked about. It just kind of puts a nice bow on what we've talked about. We're to set our minds on things above. We're to put away the old self, put on the new self, the capstone of which is love, but it binds it all together. And then when we ask what godliness is, well, it's Christ's likeness. And basically what he tells us to put on here is the attributes of Christ. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forbearance, forgiveness, love, thankfulness. And it's all accomplished by setting our minds on Christ. And then this constant pat practice of putting on, putting off, renewing the mind. That's kind of the, the pattern of the Christian life. Put off, put on, renew the mind. Put off, put on, renew the mind. Another way of saying that is faith and repentance. Believe in Jesus, turn from sin. Go to Christ, turn from sin. All right, any thoughts on chapter four? I'm about out of time. Pretty short chapter. Yeah, it's it's really convicting. I mean, especially just in seeing the text that you read, thinking along the lines of uh, God empowers us to do these things. And so if we're not growing in godliness, I mean, we're the ones to blame here. I mean, just here in Colossians 3, if we've been raised with Christ, we have this resurrection power within us. Verse 5, put to death. Verse 12, put on. And so God equips us to be able to do these things. And so if these things are not happening in us, I mean, this, this text directs us where to point the blank, point the finger. And, you know, that comes back at ourselves. So that's really convicting. I've, I've heard it put this way on the flip side. When we give in to sin, I mean, we chose what we wanted uh, because God gives us the way out by the spirit. He gives us a way to fight sin, to avoid temptation, those types of things. And so uh, I'm encouraged, but I'm also convicted at the same time by this text. So yeah, that's good. Other thoughts?
Well, like, I'm curious, you shared last week um, kind of the negative example of someone that you asked to mentor you early on when you got saved. And he's like, I don't know anything. Um, what was your first positive experience or um, what did that turn into for you eventually with someone else? Yeah. Um, you know, I can't point early on. I probably can't point to much. And that was kind of a frustrating thing. Uh, honestly, my, my first, see, what year was that? That was probably 2002. And I just didn't have a lot of help, honestly. And so what I would turn to was books. And I'm so thankful for books, and I hope you all are too. One of the things about books, it's certainly not the way to be discipled by any means, but it is, it is being discipled. And so when we read a book, even this guy, right? What we're doing here is we're being discipled by Robbie Gallaty. Robbie Gallaty has been a faithful pastor for whatever it is, 15 years, and he's experienced and he knows his word. And so here he is discipling us. So early on, that was my biggest, same with marriage. I didn't have great examples, um, and so it was just through books, which is not the ideal way to do it. Uh, but later on, it just kind of became friendships. I mean, even in college, uh, started just meeting with guys, talking about the word. Uh, not that it was someone; it was mostly peers. But again, that's the beauty of it: is we grow. It's not like we have to have someone who's far ahead of us. We're still going to grow when we have Christians together around the Word of God. But I never have, I don't have, I can't really talk about a great story of how I was discipled early on. And then when I got called to ministry later, I would seek out mentors and other pastors to learn from. And still do that to this day. Any other thoughts on chapter four, godliness? Cool. Well, as we wrap up, uh, I always want to remind how God has designed the world is that what's best for us is honoring him, and that's the good life. And so when we talk about godliness, sometimes we could think of like monks or esoteric people or really like distant people, and that's just not the vision the Bible gives us. Even just what we read in Colossians 3, godliness is the good life. And so when we're growing in godliness, everything else in our life is affected, right? As we're pursuing the Lord, it affects everything, everything from relationships to parenting, to anxiety, to discouragement, to purpose, to me, all that. And so who doesn't want to become a person who's able to suffer better during pandemics or who's more patient with people when they're with them for long periods of time, or who's more forbearing, or who's able to forgive quickly, or who's gentle, or who's joyful, right? This picture of godliness is the good life where joy is found. So we ought not coming away, even though we're talking about discipline, we're not talking about drudgery. We're talking about being formed, uh, really to have true joy, regardless of how things are going outside of us. And that's what we want to do is help others do the same. Help others have true joy, true joy is found in following the Lord. And John Piper famously has uh, said that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And it's just the kindness of the Lord that he has designed the world in such a way is that we grow in godliness, we grow in joy, and then we better glorify him. So it's just, it's just beautiful how he set this world up for us. I think about Philippians 1 where Paul's talking about his ministry to the church at Philippi and the way, and so this is our ministry to help others. And this is how we should view our helping others in D groups, part of it. He's going to remain. We want to remain and continue with whoever we're with. And he says in Philippians 1 25 for your progress and joy in the faith. That's what we're about in our own walks. And then with others, we want to help people progress and help them have joy in the faith. Cause at the end of the day, it's the only place true joy is found. So. All right. Well, hey, thanks for tuning in. Um, next week, we'll cover the next two chapters. If you can grab it or grab it on Kindle, and we'll talk about uh, prayer and the word. So let me pray for us and we'll be dismissed.
God, thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for uh, the Galatees and gifting them to, to help equip us. And thank you for your plan that you've left the church. You haven't left us uh, to ourselves, but you've, you've given gifts to the church in the form of leadership who have a job to equip the saints so that we might all do our part to see the body grow and mature. And really, this is what we ought to be giving our life to in so many ways. And thank you that in it, we find joy and we find growth. We find maturity through ministry. And I pray that you would continue to equip us, encourage us, set us on fire for your glory, that we might be more zealous about you. And Lord, we do pray for our church. We pray for uh, Jolene and Betty in particular, that you would be with them as they suffer alone, that you would be their portion, you would be near to them, that their faith in you would be strong, and that even though there's much to be discouraged about, that they would be encouraged by the good news of the gospel. They would feel your love in a special way. And I pray that we would get through this soon uh, for their sake and for our sake. Thank you for some semblance of good news uh, with the uh, governor and pray that that would just continue. And we look forward to getting back together. Uh, Lord, help us not to waste this time. Be with us tonight and the rest of the week. We pray it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.